but I think a realistic expectation in the near to medium term is going to be around 50 million of TVL, just based on kind of the analysis that we've looked at what is out there, how much stablecoin is being used, where is it being used. Um, we think that's an achievable level. And that's a level that I think will provide a lot of liquidity into Cardano. Uh, and that's just really feeding the on-chain demand. What is up, Ada Nation? Welcome to Dapp Central. My name is Fareed. As a part of today's video, we're going to be speaking and sitting down with Matt Plowman, the president and founder of Mahen, bringing a fiat backed stablecoin to Cardano. As you guys are well aware, there's been tons of chat just surrounding USDC stablecoins and fiat backed currencies being brought on chain. So, without any further ado, we're going to be jumping into this. Pretty interesting conversation. Well, let me go ahead and actually bring Matt up here and we can get the show rolling. Matt, good hey, morning. How are you? Thank you for having me. Doing pretty You're good. welcome. You're welcome. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank you for your time. I know you and the entire Mahen team have been extremely busy. And just moving forward, I can definitely see that continue to ramp up as you guys get closer to your launch date. Now, I do appreciate these types of sit downs, obviously trying to bring information and just, um, more clarity, right, surrounding stable coins first and foremost, but then um, surrounding Mahen as well. So as a part of today's video, we're going to be jumping into the recent progress with respect to your guys' um, latest development update and your smart contracts. Following that, I want to talk about chain race and how the community can get involved and actually become partial owners of Mahen, if I'm not mistaken. And then let's jump into some uh, conversation surrounding liquidity and bootstrapping plans. And then I want to jump into compliance conversations. And then very lastly, or towards the end of the interview today, just some discussion surrounding fiat on ramps, and then your closing thoughts. So without any further ado, Matt, do you mind just giving us a brief introduction to yourself and Mahen? I've had you here, I think a couple of times now, but for anybody who's new, you know, give them that quick heads up. Sure. Thanks. You know, this is um, so. Mihen is uh, actually the, the name is a little strange. It's the name of the snake that's on the Ouroboros symbol in, uh, in Egyptian lore. So it's kind of a Cardano-ish name. But we are building the USDM fiat back stablecoin. The fiat back stablecoin is it's an important piece of the DeFi ecosystem in that it becomes a nice, nice composable, reliable value uh, kind of value peg to. Um, projects that that are trying to build um, you know, real world adoption, trying to build value on chain um, for for individuals who are doing you know DeFi for for projects that are trying to plan for taxes for all kinds of reasons why you might want to have something that references a dollar, but have that be on chain. Um, you know, a lot of stable coins um, on the Ethereum ecosystem are used for peer to peer payments. They're used for um, you know, for 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 borrowing and lending protocols, they're they're very useful, you know, tool to have on chain. And the ability to take one and convert it directly into fiat currency through, you know, by, by either buying it for fiat or redeeming it for fiat is an important, you know, function. Um, being able to do that uh, without much slippage through fees helps to retain the value of the token on chain and uh, helps it to properly reflect the dollar value um, of the Different assets that's paired against. So, uh, the the Mihan project has been an underway for about two years now. We went through Catalyst um, Fund Ten. We got funded, and we uh, were managed to get you know a lot of votes for Fund Ten, and um, we've been starting to get those payments in. So we're able to execute a lot lot more quickly uh, using that funding. So, um, you know the way that it works. I mean, do you, you want to get into the stablecoin itself or um, how do you want to go forward? Yeah, I think what, what you've done is really set the, the ground foundation. If you want to just go straight into Mahen and you know how that's going to work, um, I think that'll be a great way to kind of kick things off. And then next, I want to jump into you know just some of the progress with respect to the smart contracts. Okay, if you want to just kind of separate it out into two different kind of stacks, there's the the fiat side stack, and then there's the um, the on chain stack. So that the actual token itself is a standard Cardano native asset that is as composable and as interchangeable as any other Cardano native asset. You know, being on Cardano, it, the, the native asset standard there is one where the native assets are treated at a protocol level, just like ADA. So you can't, uh, it can't be locked, it can't be clawed back. 
it is free floating and, and, and infinitely composable on the on the uh, blockchain. What we saw back in 2000 and uh, you know 22, 23, a lot of these stablecoin disruptions that turned into real problems for for a lot of DeFi protocols were because there was loose pegs or there was uh, you know not convertibility into fiat. There was not you know strong uh, strong mechanisms that that kind of bound the, the value of the token. So you know, uh, the like Tether frequently got these, you know, DPEG events when there were questions about the sufficiency of reserves. Of course, Terra Luna was kind of a kind of a mess to begin with when it was all sort of, you know, one crypto and another crypto all the way down. And once the, the subordinate token lost its appeal, then the, the entire thing collapsed. So really fiat backed is the way to go. Um, so the on-chain design is innovative. In Cardano, there is, um, it's a UTXO blockchain. And so it's not an account blockchain. And the way typically that you would find the number of tokens or identify the number of tokens that are on chain is through using a blockchain snapshot. And what Mihan has done is we've come up with a way to account for the value of the number of tokens that are out there while using uh, you know, on-chain security to do that. So every time we mint a USDM, there's a counter. And then the value of that counter goes against the value of the uh, the reserve, so the off-chain stuff. Um, we have an oracle that we're working with called Charlie Three. They're a you know, primary oracle on Cardano, and the oracle value feeds a smart contract the actual reserves uh, balance. So the whatever the reserve account balance is, Charlie Three feeds that on-chain independently of of our interaction. We've given them read-only access, but without that value, then you know we can't um, we can't mint USDM. So the smart contracts that control the minting and the burning of the token integrate the Charlie 3 feed so that we understand that there's no more USDM in existence on Cardano than there is value in the off-chain fiat accounts that back USDM. And that you know tight one-to-one -one, uh, peg helps to ensure that this, the reserves are always sufficient to meet the redemptions of the tokens that that should be um, you know should be should be needed. So. You know, this is sort of an independent reserves verification. You see this a lot in in uh, traditional finance, where a lot of responsibilities for accounting and uh, and then controls and portfolio management are all separated, and those things are all kind of uh, counterbalancing each other. So we've taken that sort of tradfi model of having an independent accountant verifying the value of the thing, and then also having the the on chain reserves referencing that independent value. And I think that, that that provides a very strong peg for USDM. Um, you know, the off-chain, um, the reserves balance is going to be managed at a number of different uh, money market funds, uh, AAA rated money market funds and bank accounts. The reserve account is going to be at uh, a couple of different money market funds at either Western Asset Management or Fidelity. Um, and we have sort of a reserves intermixing bank there that that takes the the, the fiat and sends it off to the to the investment accounts. And so there's a little bit of a complicated setup there to get the fiat from you into the reserve account. Once it's a reserve account, though, um, that that value is the one that controls the the amount of USDM that's that's um, available in the ecosystem. So it's a very transparent mechanism to provide sufficient reserves in an independent manner and make sure that individually, um, you know, a person who's using USDM can re can rely on the fact that. An independent party has attested that there's plenty of reserves in there, and then they actually use the smart contract to control that. So it's kind of a check on us as well. I feel like I'm I'm being taken back to school there, Matt. It's um, no, I mean you did a really good job of breaking it down in layman's terms uh, from beginning to end. You broke down why we need the fiat backed stable coin, how it works, and then you also touched on exactly how you guys are verifying that you guys aren't minting more than you guys should be, right? So I think that was actually a compliment. I really do appreciate that. Again, for anybody who's hearing about Mahan for the first time, I think they would have found those last couple of minutes to be very, very helpful. Now, one thing, and this is, I think, just a, a small kind of a side tangent that I want to jump into before we go into the next topic. It's just going to be surrounding the Oracle provider, right? So as you mentioned right now, you guys are working with um, C3 or Charlie 3. You know, people tend to, at least on my videos, right, comment about how that can actually be a bottleneck when you're only working with one specific Oracle provider. And if they have issues, then that potentially could cause issues for USDM and that minting and burning mechanism. 
So in the future, do you see, you know, uh, Mahen utilizing multiple Oracle providers? And then I have another question surrounding a potential bottleneck after that. Well, we're very confident in Charlie 3's ability to deliver what they've committed to delivering. I think that a lot of Oracle solutions that require you know, real-time updates or, or very frequent updates to values of cross-currency changes, you know, Charlie 3 for us is providing essentially one value a day or one value per refresh of the fiat accounts. And those will change um, at the end of the day when you settle all of the transactions, then we'll have a new value. And then using that new value, we'll either mint or burn USDM according to that amount. So that's how it all works. Um, but the way that on Cardano, you define a token is through uh, what's called a monetary policy script. And the monetary policy, if that were to ever change, then the token policy would change itself. Or the token, the token, uh, you know, the, the on-chain identifier of the token uh, called the, uh, you know, the token name or the, uh, the, 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 the policy ID of the token would, would change. So for the USDM stablecoin, what we've done is we've taken to defining the stablecoin itself and the monetary policy to reference other smart contracts. And so if the smart contract that, that consumes the Oracle and presents a value for the Oracle were to change, you know, so, so if, if just like you would take a, um, you know, if the monetary policy changes, so if we change the Oracle, um, it would change the monetary policy. So what we've done is we've defined the monetary policy to include the, um, you know, the, what's called an Oracle consumer or a, or a signing key consumer. And so these are sort of, sort of like bridges to the actual Oracle and the actual signing key. So we can redirect the Oracle to another Oracle if we need to, we can change that without changing the policy ID itself. And with that, we've been given ourselves, you know, a great deal of flexibilities to put in a second Oracle or a third Oracle or use, you know, balance, you know, two of three, um, that kind of thing. And it's really that that kind of it would, it would you know, any changes we make to it would be visible on chain. They would be immediately known, um, you know, by like monitors who would watch this sort of thing. Except one of the things that came out and the reason for our delay is that the audit that we went through identified correctly that if if we can change the oracle, then we could change it to something that's absolutely arbitrary. We could change it to some fake oracle and say, uh, actually, there's a trillion dollars of USDM in the reserve, so we're going to mint a ton and just dump it on the community. Like that's that's a sort of uh, vulnerability that that the audit came up with. It was really not a not any problem with like the logic of the smart contracts or things that are not working. It was really kind of uh, protecting the community from Mihen. So what the recommendation was was that we add in time delays. And so we add in. You know, when we change the Oracle, we, we initiate the change, but then the change doesn't become effective for some time. And then in the interim, people will be able to see what the new Oracle is supposed to be, verify that it's real. Or if it's some kind of rogue internal actor, then the others from the team can, can turn it, you know, dial it back and go back to the old Oracle before that timer is, is delayed. So that's the sort of time delays that we added into the, the policy to make sure that all of the pieces of the of the puzzle work together correctly and are secure, not only from outside actors, but also from internal theft as well. Um, then the, the final bit is you can kind of take that, that flexibility model to its ultimate conclusion where you say, well, what about making the policy idea itself a flexible model as well, you know, with the time delays, with the multi-signature uh, factors, and make sure that those things all work together so that if Mihen should be uh, upgraded to Plutus V3, or if the smart contract standards on Cardano should change in any way, you know, how would we adjust the token to meet that, but then also have it continue to be used throughout the Cardano DeFi ecosystem. And that's something that you know, we're very grateful to the Sunday Swap team, Pi in particular, for really highlighting that we can be entirely, we can be ultimately flexible as, as flexible as, as possible and future-proof the token. So that last little bit required us to really rethink the entire kind of front, front to back design of the, of the token. And while the same Oracle controlled minting and the same ability to 
rotate signing keys, ability to change the Oracle if, if there should be a problem with it or if we wanted to add, add additional ones or if, the, if Charlie 3 changed their standard, we'd want to be able to change to modify to accept that as well without having these knock-on effects that would cause the token to be, you know, have to use USDMV2 or whatever, like later on. So we added in that strategic uh, transparent flexibility all the way through the entire smart contract uh, based token all the way through to the, uh, the the core of the token. So, you know, one of the things that that we were, were kind of playing around with is using a side chain to account for all of the reserves of Mihan as a company. And so if we were to ever get to a point where we can have our banks and have our accountants and have everybody that's responsible for the operations of the company reporting everything onto a side chain or a partner chain, then we could use that kind of infrastructure to again control USDM and make sure that it is the premier stable coin in Cardano and that it is the one that's the most transparent, most efficient, and most uh, accountable to the community. So that's kind of the way we're, we're thinking about doing this. Um, and so that we can be reliable for the long run and not just you know rush to launch, launch, and then, oops, sorry, we got to do V2. Then all of the partners that we've integrated with, all of the dApps and all of the, the exchanges and all of the uh, you know, lending borrowing protocols and all the people who are just using it to to pay things all of a sudden have a second token, and you know, never mind the like that that's inconvenient, but it's also sort of a, a vector for attack. And so somebody else could say, oh yeah, we're we're me and V two. They come out and they lie about you know what it is. And so if we go and and add additional tokens into the ecosystem, we provide the opportunity for scammers and you know social engineers to come and try to try to manipulate the whole thing. So you know, we really got. It was, it was annoying and it was, it's, it's unfortunate that we had to kind of push back, but I think it's the right thing to do because we wanted to make sure that we did everything that we could to get it right on launch and have it be exactly what it needs to be for now and for the future. You made some really great points there and I'm not going to spend too, too much time, you know, responding, but I want to say that I agree with your guys' approach to making sure to measure twice and only cut once. There's been so many products that have done the opposite that, as you mentioned, have had to pay the price when it comes to fragmented liquidity or even just additional or new token policies, which only introduce confusion for the community. And as you mentioned, more potential attack vectors. And so I don't think that for the majority, at least here, I don't think that the majority of the community um, was against your guys' decision. I think if anything, when I released the update talking about your delay, more people were actually happy that you guys were taking the time to actually build things out correctly. Now, I did want to jump into chain raise next, but while we're still kind of just talking about, you know, um, the liquidity, the reserves, et cetera, I want to just kind of post another quick question. So with fiat backed stable coins, and I'm sure that you probably agree that it'd be somewhat risky to actually mint the exact amount that's in the reserves on chain in case that there is some sort of um, minute error, et cetera, whatever that could be. So I just want to just maybe kind of clear things up here. You know, when we take a look at other fiat backed stable coins, they might have, you know, a thousand dollars in the reserves, but they might only have 900 tokens on chain just to kind of account for any sort of error there. You know, does Mahan plan on doing the same thing? And if yeah. so, you know, what is sort of the margin of error on that end? We haven't come up with any hard margin of error yet, but it's, there's definitely going to be an you know, excess reserves. I think in many of the states that we're looking for licenses in, you have to have excess reserves in, in the order of $100,000 or so here, you know, just kind of to, to, to cap up the, um, you know, the, the reserves um, against what you're issuing. So there's there's regulations around that that make sense. And there's also, you know, the potential for having, you know, people defraud us and try to claw their money back and try to get the fiat uh, back out when they don't, you know, um, you know, there's there's always these sort of scammers and grifters that try to do stuff. And so we're building a lot of security around that as well. So we have risk-based frameworks to evaluate whether or not a, a an individual transaction is, is at risk of being fraudulent or not. So there's lots, lots that we're doing. Everybody that comes and mints, mints a USDM has to do a KYC with a real identity verification and like a face scan usually. Um, and then, so that's the kind of thing that we're looking at incorporating into the the, the deeper layer of the uh, you know, the kind of the off-chain operational controls that we have in place. And so, yeah, having an excess reserve is is required by many of the states that we're operating in. 
and uh, it's it's a good best best practice as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. You did mention KYC. We're going to jump into that in just a minute. Before we do, though, um, I did want to ask one more thing, and this is just going to be surrounding liquidity and bootstrapping, right? So as you mentioned, anybody will be able to come undergo KYC AML procedures. They'll be able to mint if they want to, right? USDM, which can then actually be used on chain. Now, of course, I would assume that there might be some bigger players here because again, this is not going to just be your average token, right? That mint quite a bit, bring it on chain and then allow for community members that don't want to necessarily undergo the KYC process to still get access to USDM, et cetera. So, you know, my question to you is typically, when we have tokens that are launching on Cardano or on chain, they set aside a certain amount of their tokenomics for bootstrapping, for providing that to platforms, for example, like a DEX, like MinSwap, Wingriders, Sunday Swap, et cetera. You know, how does Mahen plan on bootstrapping and getting that initial liquidity for anybody who wants to get access to USDM, but doesn't necessarily want to actually mint it? They just want to jump on MinSwap, et cetera, and swap their ADA for USDM. So we've done a couple of things. We've been actively working with regulators in all the states to make sure that we can operate legally. And we've been given approval in, uh, I believe, 17 states right now, including big ones like Virginia and um, you know, Wisconsin, Wyoming, California. It's good, you know, a lot of the ones in the middle of the country that have a more freedom-oriented policy toward crypto are very good about uh, working with us. So Tennessee, um, Connecticut even. So we have a lot of good states that have that have good guidance on on the licensing that we, we need or we don't need for operating in those states. So that's going to be naturally there's going to be like a gap, right? So if you're in Texas or if you're in um, you know, Florida, we, we we do operate in Florida, um, but in many of the states, you're not going to be able to get USDM, and you'll be able to get it though if you bought it on a Dex. Oh yeah, that's an older 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 slide. We have. Tennessee, yes. Connecticut, yes. New Hampshire, yes. Uh, Indiana, Illinois, no. West Virginia, no. Florida, yes. So I think we'll try to find you an updated one of those maps. But you know, there's been a lot of a lot of progress on this, and to, to the extent that we are, um, we understand that there'll be a gap. We've made some good partnerships with some you know important ecosystem players to uh, to mint a uh, you know, substantial amount of USDM at the beginning. And to be able to continue to provide. So if we see like a DPEG to 101, 102, 103, as people are using, you know, needing it, buying it on chain and using it in the ecosystem, there'll be a nice arbitrage opportunity for individuals who want to come in and then kind of make that, you know, fill that demand, buy it from us for a dollar and, and then make the trade on chain. And so we hope that, that the natural market forces will help with bringing additional liquidity into the space because as you can see, it's always going to be backed by a dollar. You can always get your dollar back. You can always, you know, buy it for a dollar. So it's sort of this hard peg one dollar token that can always, you know, be minted or redeemed. If you see there's, you know, it's trading for ninety nine, ninety eight. Buy it on chain, come redeem it, and then get your dollar. So you can. It's like natural market forces. We believe will will actually come in to fill the demand for USDM in the in the longer term. But in the in the near term, yeah, we have partnered with a great number of, of, you know, important ecosystem providers to help bootstrap the initial liquidity. Um, you know, we have estimates as to what that should be, but we don't actually have a very good hard estimate on how much USDM. And I think that nobody really would, we would have to really see what the market would need in that case. And so, you know, we have, we have good providers that are ready to jump in. And we also have, um, you know, a lot of opportunistic individuals in the community that are able to do it as well. I appreciate the transparency on that. I think the very last liquidity question that I want to pose before we move along is going to be surrounding how much we can expect, right? So obviously there are some more established stable coins that have been around operating in ERC20 compatible networks around EVM chains. You know, they're holding upwards of billions of dollars. At the end of the day, they had to start somewhere, you know? Mm -hmm. So taking a look at when Mahen starts, what kind of liquidity could we expect? Again, I know that you probably don't have hard numbers, but, you know, is it millions, billions, you know, anything that you can give us there to kind of set, set the playing field? Your lips to God's ears on billions. Um, you know, I think that a reasonable estimate for what the Cardano ecosystem might need in a fiat backed stablecoin is around $50 million. Um, if you look to 
some of the comps on a you know on a on a on the ethereum basis or on a comparable um you know size chain sometimes the stablecoin tvl equals 100 percent of the market cap of the base l1 token so in that case you might see enough stable coins including jet or iusd or any of the others that are coming along to be around teens of billions a um, couple dozen billion maybe if uh, if cardano should uh, you know gain some some pump during this cycle you know we may be, we may see you know many billions uh, but i think a realistic expectation in the near to medium term is going to be around 50 million of tvl just based on kind of the analysis that we've looked at what is out there how much stablecoin is being used where is it being used um, we think that's an achievable level and that's a level that i think will provide a lot of liquidity into cardano uh, and that's just really feeding the on-chain demand you know there's a lot of need for stable coins to do things that are not DeFi. so some people who live in places where there are no um where there are no reliable financial systems you know some places in uh you know, I'm reminded of of going on missions trips to Haiti. My father came back from from these missions trips, and he said, "Well, there's really nobody there who relies on the government for help, relies on the the banks for help. They don't have any confidence in any of their formal institutions, so they need alternatives." And to the extent that you know, fiat backed stablecoins on public open blockchains can provide that additional capability for individuals who are the most vulnerable, I think that it's the kind of thing that you know, we really want to be able to serve them as well. So when you think about, you know, when we think about the roadmap and how we can go forward to serving individuals who are not just involved in Cardano DeFi, but who are involved in maybe needing Cardano for their, you know, actual livelihood and their actual, you know, conducting business and that kind of thing. You know, we're really working hard to to come up with a solution that future proofs us or provides us the ability to to expand out beyond the kind of on-chain DeFi ecosystem. So in that, in that case, you know, it could be many billions. You know, there's there's a lot of need for that. It's just it's a matter of you know looking at the chain and saying, well, 300 million TBL, maybe we'll get a sixth of that. You know, 50 million seems like a reasonable goal. Yeah, um, I totally agree with you there. And again, nothing wrong with with having big dreams, right? But we all have to start from somewhere. And so I just want to quickly pull this up here for the viewers, just to kind of put things into perspective. You're right. You know, you just mentioned that three hundred and thirty-seven oh, yeah. million dollars in terms of TDL. But if I go and actually toggle this off, right, we only have about let's see there eighteen or so million dollars in terms of stable coins. So if Mahan were able to bring on fifty million, right, that would be a little bit over two x of what we currently currently have, which I think would be huge. You guys would basically be the dominant force on Cardano, and then backing that up with what you mentioned earlier there, right, with the uh, natural supply and demand to actually keep the dollar pegged. I think that would put you guys in a really good position to continue to dominate in this marketplace moving forward. Um, there's been concerns with other types of stable coins. Again, not knocking everybody here because, again, we're all building on Cardano and we're all trying yeah. to provide solutions. But those other stable coins do tend to have issues and those things do tend to crop up every once in a while. And so I think that's why there's been such a huge demand for a fiat backed stable coin, which hopefully we'll get here. I believe it's on March 16th of yeah. 2024. So that I think will take us through the portion surrounding the initial liquidity, bootstrapping, et cetera. The next thing I wanted to just quickly jump into was just the compliance aspect of things. And if you do have to jump, Matt, don't hesitate to let me know. I, um, I know that you're not 100% in terms of you know how you're feeling, but I do appreciate yeah. what you've been doing so far. You're really dropping a lot of information here. And like I said, not only will I appreciate it, I'm sure that the viewers you will appreciate it as well. So with respect to just compliance, right? Obviously, you guys are working with, you know, regulators within multiple states to make sure you guys are compliant. One of the biggest things that Mahen is actually touting, right, is the fact that there's not going to be some of these regulatory features that some of the bigger stable coins have. So do you mind kind of touching on, you know, some of the positive aspects of not having freezing and not having clawbacks? Because, again, I think that also aligns with Cardano's vision, right, which is to be permissionless, trustless and um, fully transparent when it comes to those things. Um, yeah, that's, you know, we can really unpack that a lot and really get into what this actually is. And I think that the, the, the clawbacks, the freezing, some of the features, quote unquote features of a, of an ERC 20 token 
are are not it's kind of a red herring to be frank the need for anybody to lock a native asset should have been clarified with bitcoin and the fact that regulated exchanges and the sec now is you know blessed as the bitcoin etf and when we think about what's needed in an ecosystem the necessary thing really is to control its interaction points with the fiat system so if individuals are using a, a cryptocurrency like bitcoin to transact they're using a cryptocurrency like bitcoin to um you know to do their business then nobody claws back or um nobody nobody freezes nobody you know takes bitcoin out of your wallet except you when you sign transactions so there's really you know you think about these this colorful couple that got arrested in new york for doing some bitcoin theft and ended up getting uh getting arrested um you know for using atms to withdraw the bitcoin and these various connection points that these individuals have with the fiat system are the place where they end up needing the kyc needing to go through the process of identifying themselves and law enforcement has been very clear about the need for doing this but they also have been very clear about how useful cryptocurrency really is in conducting crime and doing um you know, doing the kinds of things that that they want to be sure that we don't have like terrorism finance or human trafficking or any of these other things that that happen in the uh, in the underworld so you know my, my thinking on this whole topic is if you look at Bitcoin as the guide, and you say, well, nobody asks the Bitcoin marketplaces to freeze Bitcoin in people's wallets, or they don't ban them from interacting with the fiat banking system because they have the ability to, you know, don't have the ability to claw back people's Bitcoin transactions. It's the same way with Cardano native assets. You know, ADA is just as much a free floating fiat convertible asset as USDM. And to that, to that point, Oski or Snack or Starch or any of the different, you know, the Ape Society coin, like any of these tokens that are on Cardano could be convertible to fiat for a price. And the fact that they can't be locked doesn't actually matter for that token's convertibility. It's really how you view cryptocurrency in general. Um, you know, if you don't think that cryptocurrency, you think all cryptocurrency should be that can convert to fiat or can be sold for fiat or bought for fiat can be needs to be clawed back needs to be frozen you're really missing the whole point of this you know freedom centric ecosystem you, know, you want to make sure that the, the touch points with the fiat system are, are safe and secure that's why we kyc everybody that comes to mint or burn and you want to make sure that any on-chain activity that happens that's associated with crime that those utxos or those coins that are associated with that activity when they hit the fiat conversion system that they're also locked and, and able to be you know, not converted and you go in with alert authorities to that um you know to the extent that we comply with those laws we do and to the extent that those laws apply to us that you know they do the the thing about usdc and i really you know, i'd rather not speak for them about why they do it but i'll say that in an erc20 token in a transfer of an erc20 token the smart contract that defines the token actually does the transferring so every peer-to-peer -peer ERC-20 token transfer is a transfer that is facilitated by the smart contract that is under the control of the token issuer. And to that end, because the smart contract does the transferring, you can very reasonably say that Circle Internet Financial Corp or Tether Corp or whatever the hell backs Tether, they are actually doing the transferring instead of having it be a true peer-to-peer -peer transfer. And that's the difference between Cardano and Ethereum. If you are the one who is doing the transfer, yeah, definitely you have to make the clawback because you're going to be complicit in some kind of crime if you're the one that's making the payments. You're facilitating the payment between criminal A and criminal B for some kind of criminal activity. Yeah, Circle can be held responsible for that. And to the extent that a similar activity happens in other blockchains, Cardano, Bitcoin, Lightning Network, whatever you want to say, you say, well, those are the transactions that need to be flagged. And that when these Bitcoins hit the 
hit the regular world and hit the hit the rails on the ends to go to fiat, that's when you control it. So it's an entirely different paradigm on Ethereum and on EVM blockchains. And so I think there's a lot of people who are taking the bait and saying, well, if we can come up with a freezable lockable token standard, then of course these ERC20 token makers will come over here and launch their tokens on Cardano. And I think that maybe Cardano is a, and Cardano is a very attractive ecosystem for a lot of reasons. And in, in my mind, it's a great place to go and build a business. And it's a good place to go and, and, and a good, good community to go and serve. They haven't done it yet, though. And I don't think it's because they require it to be locked or clawbacks or whatever. Maybe, maybe they're just happy with that from a cultural perspective. I think that they, they need to do it on, on ERC-20 because the ERC-20 token is not a UTXO contained item that can be transferred natively across the blockchain like a Cardano native asset. I think that's what a lot of that is what makes Cardano special is that it's it really is Bitcoin with smart contracts instead of being some Ethereum killer. It's 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 a much better L1 than you would expect to see from you know Ethereum based projects. And so uh, that's kind of my whole thing with, with this is is I don't want to say USDC would be a bad thing for us. I think that people appreciate it. I don't know why people would use it. I've only used USDC to cash out, you know, to do transactions on Coinbase. That's the only time I've ever had USDC. It's not like it's a core holding of mine. But at the same time, some people have USDC. Some people pre prefer to transact in USDC because they can, you know, send reasonable amounts of, of uh, reasonable amounts of, of value to each other using that token. So I'm, I'm not going to really disparage anybody that that wants that that on on Cardano I would just hesitate to say that it's like the very most important thing that we need to have in this ecosystem I think there's a lot happening that needs to happen on Cardano before it becomes really fully what it needs to be for um you know for, for it to be the, the financial operating system of the world and, and we're, we're working on it you know going through the the SIP 1694 process we're going through the community governance process we're going through all of the Different growing pains that come with scalability, that come with uh, you know, additional smart contract capabilities. Like these are all things that the community is doing a great job of building. And if we can get community built nodes, if we can get more decentralization on the on the technology side, we can really be a fantastic you know place to go and and really be that that next winner and when it comes to the next bull run. Um, but I don't know that making you know Cardano native assets a, a bad thing. Um, or change, trying to change the native asset standard to be one that that needs to be or can be locked and clawed back or or whatever. Um, I don't think that'd be a good idea. So that's just that's just my my full like <laughs> my full rant on it. This I think is hands down the best interview that you and I have had. Um, again, you made some really really great points there, Matt. Um, so I mean, just to to kind of summarize it here, what it appears to boil down to, at least from your perspective, is the fact that. Ethereum operates on an account-based model, which puts a little bit of the responsibility, right? When it comes to the technical aspects of the transfers being done on Ethereum um, to whoever's in charge of the smart contract, which as you mentioned, would be Tether, Circle, whoever's the actual, you know, provider of such stable coin. Whereas on Cardano, because we're operating in a much more different fashion with the extended UTXO model, these transactions are actually peer-to-peer -peer where that that responsibility aspect wouldn't necessarily be needed right and so um, i really appreciate that that's actually the first time that i've heard it broken down in that way and how you know it makes sense for them to have those clawback and freezing mechanisms needed on ethereum um, again because of the responsibility factor versus not needing it here on cardano one thing that i've heard is that fiat currency whether it's usdm whether it's you know usdc usdt that is basically an online representation of a government's, you know, property, right? And so in order to make sure that they're still in full control, just like they are with physical cash, that is actually why they would want to have the clawback or the freezing aspects, right? Um, and then also just to make sure that from a regulatory, regulatory standpoint, if they need to take any action that they can uh, without, you know, having anybody interfere. So I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on that, because again, I think you made a really good point about the responsibility portion and why it's needed on EVM networks. But what about, you know, the 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 other side of the coin here, which is respect to governments wanting to make sure that they're in control of their own assets um, in the case that they need to do something drastic? 
I would think that those people who have made those statements don't have a good basis in fact for making them. I think that in the United States, I hope we still have rule of law and I hope we still have the ability to you know be you know I think self custody cryptocurrency is the is 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 not beyond government reach. You know, you can if they, if you were doing something bad with the currency, if you were doing something illegal, then they would tap you on the shoulder and, and I guess ask for your seed phrase or, or get your keys. So those are the kinds of things that are assumptions that have really not a whole lot of basis in in fact. Um, you know, recently there was guidance given by the Bank of International Settlements, which is in like a multinational organization regarding the use of cryptocurrency and illegal activities and regarding how to safeguard the fiat system against potential abuse you know, with the use of cryptocurrencies. And these are some of the more thoughtful analyses of the ecosystem. And they are very wide open. Their, their eyes are wide open when it comes to the potential risks of illicit activity in the space. Uh, just like the rest of us are, you know, we're very open about the potential, but we want to make sure that we safeguard against that and provide the proper balance between individual freedom and liberty and the um, the need to safeguard the system against abuse. So in, in none of these cases, in none of these international organization bodies, is there any discussion of having the ability to lock, freeze, or claw back cryptocurrency? And while we do have fiat bank accounts, we do have fiat investment accounts that are, you know, held in the US and, and held by SEC regulated, you know, broker dealers and FDIC regulated banks and OCC and Fed. You know, there are there's a lot happening in the world right now that is would be it would be badly affected if the FDIC or the OCC or the Fed or the SEC were to say your account is because it backs up a cryptocurrency is not allowed. That there are many accounts that are backing up, you know, there are reserve accounts to back up certain securities instruments. And there's reserve accounts to back up, you know, things like like uh, gift cards and things like bank transfers. And so as long as we operate within the laws that also affect those things, then anything that they should do to come after us would also come after those things. So to the extent that, you know, yeah, the claw, I don't, I don't, the, 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 nothing's, there's nothing, no, there's no base in fact on any of this stuff. The, the clawbacks concern is really about the way the EVM in the ERC-20 token functions. It's really not at all about government control and to the extent that you want to be censorship resistant, yeah, you need to kind of broaden your geographic reach and you need to have accounts that are in different places and you want to make sure that you have the ability should the government turn tyrannical. But I don't think that that's a concern at the current moment because you know the same things are happening with, with USDC. If it wants USDC on Cardano, they're doing the same thing that we're doing. They're holding an account at a number of different banks and they're promising to redeem a token for a dollar. Now that token can be clawed back and it can be frozen and it can be um, segregated and it can be, but we we don't have to redeem every USDM. If, if we have criminal USDM coming to us, then we can just hold on to it and not redeem it. Like the same thing can happen. Like the activities that the company takes with regard to how it treats its token when it's presented is entire. That's, that's the entire point is we control the, we control the, the, the transact transfer between you know, us and the users. And if the users are criminals, we say no. And then they will maybe sell it on chain for ADA and they'll try to get cash for their ADA. And, you know, you, you want to make sure that you're publicized that these guys are scammers, these guys are illegal. You want to make sure that that people know that to not interact with, you know, say a wallet that's the property of some, you know, OFAC sanctioned individual. You want to make sure that that's socialized and publicized. And I would maybe be a little naive to say we don't see a lot of that on Cardano, but we actually don't see a lot of that on Cardano. And we we know that because we've talked with all of the Chainalysis in, individuals. Um, you know, Chainalysis is one of them. 
And there's a couple of other vendors that we've also talked with to try to get a good sense of how do we track a token? How do we make sure that we know what this token is? Every centralized exchange will have a robust know your token policy. And they'll do the exact same thing. If they say, if you send illicit Bitcoin to an ex centralized exchange, they will check that token and make sure that it's from a proper place. And then if it's been flagged as illegal, then they will notify authorities and they will not redeem that, that Bitcoin for fiat. And the same thing happens with USDM. We, we have operational controls that are in line with those that are, are at centralized exchanges when it comes to transferring the token you know, into fiat and, and from fiat. So that's that's really where we're at with, with this whole thing. And, you know, I, I would not give much credence to individuals who say, well, the government definitely wants you to lock it up because they have some vague concern about controlling all of the currency and having everything be under their control. I mean, there are lots of examples of private cash. There's There's money market funds. There's you know, ETFs that, that are posted and treated as cash for collateral. Treasuries are treated as cash for collateral. All of these things trade with regulated and unregulated parties. And it's not always clawbackable. It's not always, you know, not always able to be um, to be taken. Some of these are in a different form where they could be held and not 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 surrendered. So like there's there's a lot of misunderstanding and, and misperceptions and fears. And you can imagine that the people who are very concerned about this stuff are very freedom oriented, and they're very concerned with um, maybe they're, maybe they're preppers, maybe they're thinking about you know disaster scenarios uh, just as a course of habit, and that's that's probably a good thing for a lot of people to be thinking about, and to be thinking about well, what happens if the government turns tyrannical and wants to seize all of the dollars? Well, like okay, but I think that that's really a far off scenario that has no basis in fact or lived experience. Thank you. Um, again, you made Sorry, I don't mean really, to rant. Really just, I get I get a little <laughs> No. Th this is and I tell this to everybody that comes in the channel when they feel like you are. This is exactly why we're here, right? Is to give you an outlet to speak and to let the community hear what your thoughts and how Mahan is going to be operating. So I think you made some really good points there. Um, for the sake of time, you know, I'm not going to dive any deeper into that topic. We do have a live stream tomorrow in which I think you'll be joining us as well. So yeah. I think we can we can expound on some of those things there. But you made some really good points there. Um, so I've got two more quick rapid fire questions and then we're going to close things out again. I want to respect your time here, Matt. The next is going to be surrounding just the minting and burning, right? So one key difference between Mahen and some of these other um, fiat backed stable coins is that they have specific partners or specific entities, right, that have the ability to actually mint and burn their assets. Whereas Mahen has taken a much more community driven route where anybody can come in as long as I believe they go through KYC and uh, AML um, verification. You know, so with respect to that, you know, does that provide an additional burden on you guys? Because again, I would imagine you guys will be having to deal with more people that want to mint and burn, even if it's, you know, a hundred USDM. And again, I'm not sure if there's even a limit, you know, um, a minimum amount to burn or not burn, but in a minimum amount to mint, I should say. Yep. And then does that also just put more of a responsibility on you guys? Right. Because again, if somebody is able to somehow slip through those KYC AML cracks and then they mint USDM, you know, when they shouldn't have been, does that reflect on you guys? So again, just trying to understand why you guys have taken this different route as opposed to saying, hey, only these certain people or these certain entities can actually mint or burn USDM or re redeem USDM. We could do that, I guess. Um, we don't have the large entity restrictions. I think what we'll have is we'll have a, you know, kind of a baseline fee, like a minimum fee to mint. So that would necessarily limit the price at which somebody would be willing to, to mint, right? So it kind of nat naturally limits to you know, kind of you know larger size orders, but if you were to look at some of the larger stable coins that are on Ethereum, they don't direct mint, but they you know Coinbase does direct mint USDC to individuals, so they KYC everybody. Even though I mean, they may not direct mint new, but they'll you know if Coinbase is the maker of USDC or if they're one of the participating partners in, in Circle, then they're giving you know they're taking that KYC risk on. 
So it's not necessarily the stablecoin issue that's taken on the risk. It's the, it's a centralized exchange, but there's kind of a, it's kind of a distinction without a difference. Um, what I what I would say about you know yeah the big ones don't may don't let you mint you know you mint directly with them at the clip of like a hundred thousand dollar minimum fee or minimum uh, amount for USDT for example, but there are some good fiat backed stable coins. I think True USD, I think on Ethereum, um, and a couple of others that do let you mint directly as an individual. And you'll go through the same process that, that we're experiencing. And I guess the small guys kind of have to do that because they don't have the institutional um, partners like Circle would. Um, they don't have the you know $80 billion that Tether does to make sure that there's enough, um, you know, that we they can just turn everybody away. They make it make it make it really, really expensive to mint and then turn away small guys and really kind of keep those economies of scale very high. Um, but for, for us, it's it's more about the community. I think as, as we look to our roadmap, we'd like to get to a situation where we have you know payment solutions using USDM. I know that the drip drops guys have come up with their main street thing, and we are also sort of looking to support that effort and and make sure that that we can get individuals that use this. Um, you know, to the extent that we have fees from our banking partners to, to send out wires or to send out ACH transfers, we're going to need to include that in the fee to burn or the fee to mint. And that will make the small values less, less appealing, but it'll also make the token a little less usable. So to the extent that we can get somebody like Main Street on, you know, online to do payment services using USDM, we could do like one daily net settlement with Main Street, Visa, MasterCard, whatever it is, and have them, instead of sending out a few hundred wires a day, we'll send out like a few dozen to individuals plus like one net one to MasterCard. So you can you can get to the operational efficiencies, um, yeah, the, kind of the efficiencies of scale with larger partners like Tether has, or you can just start out small like we're doing. And I think that you know, we'd rather be we'd rather be where we are and have to bear the burdens of doing KYC for everybody and making sure that we have you know good sound operational controls on all of the things that we're doing and then we can be a better partner for our users that way so yeah i think that nobody really thinks about tether corp they all think about usdt i think that we would rather individuals think about mehen as a, a partner on their journey to put their financial life into cardano rather than uh, kind of some tool that they use that's part of a bigger ecosystem but they don't think about the the different people that are actually working to to provide those services for them so fair points raised again um i think one of the biggest things you mentioned there was you know being a smaller project that you may not get the amount of inflows that would constitute you guys you know setting a, a high bar to work with people but the number two you also mentioned you know somewhat of a bunching approach, right? Where you may be able to take a lot of these smaller things and settle them, um, you know, uh, a couple of times per day, as opposed to trying to settle everybody's transactions per day, making that more of a headache for you guys. So, you know, as we get ready to kind of land the plane here, one of the biggest things I think Mahan brings to the table is going to be their fiat on-ramp and off-ramp. Do you mind explaining for the average person here watching today's video, you know, how will that work? Will it be as simple as, you know, connecting your own bank account to the Mahen platform undergoing KYC and then deciding how much you want to mint that amount being withdrawn from your bank account and then that immediately being sent as USDM on chain and then the reverse happening when looking to off ramp. It would not be immediate. So let me just say just right up front that USDM is when you mint it, you, we, we were working with, um, we are working with Plaid, which is a noteworthy provider of bank integrations in the US and they work with multiple banks. So when we go and we initiate a transaction or we have you initiate a bank linkage, you'll you link the bank account using Plaid, you'll initiate the process of minting, send in the USD, and then it will take five days to settle. Um, the reason for that is similarly with the centralized exchange, the five day settlement window is one where you could, if you wanted to be a scammer, you could cancel the transaction with your bank, 
pay a fee and then have the money returned to you. Um, that would be a bad thing for, for USDM and for Mehan because we would then, you would have tokens in your self custody wallet when at the same time we would have, uh, you know, no money. And so that we're waiting for the, for the fiat to settle before we met the USDM. But after the five day delay, then you should be able to receive the USDM uh, right away. The other way to do it is to initiate a wire, have a wire transfer come into the Mehan account using the wire instructions that you'll be given uh, when you set up an account, then that would be a more, um, it'll be an overnight process. And so the next day you'd be able to receive the USDM in your self-custody wallet after it's minted, after the wires and everything settle, after the Charlie 3 feed reflects the new balance of the account, and then we can go ahead and mint. So there's, it's an overnight process for minting. Uh, if you meant using a bank transfer, that's an ACH transfer, it would be five days. If you meant using a, a wire, that would be a next day settlement. But there's, it's not really like immediate, immediate. Now coming back, it, it is immediate. So you'll be able to come in and then burn the USDM and then receive the, the, the USD in your linked bank account the, that night or the next day, depending on how your bank processes those transactions. So that, that's a quicker process than minting. Again, I think you raised some fair points in terms of the settlement time. That's something that's completely out of your control. I've used platforms like Binance and Coinbase, and that's probably one of the biggest headaches, right? Is when you're trying yeah. to get your, your ADA in your account and you have to wait for that time, that time for the settle or for the um, funds to settle. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like, as you mentioned, on the way out, that won't be the case, which I think is, is really positive there as well. So Matt, the very last thing I want to talk. If I could, yeah, before ahead. the, the, that's that's just put some hope out there and say this is how it's going to be at launch this is how it's going to be as we're building the the token or as we're bringing it to market once we get bigger and we have more tvl and we have more you know capital in the in the company and we we can go through the process of potentially bearing individuals who would be you know bearing the risk of of fraudulent transactions um you know we may end up with a risk based framework that may allow individuals to you know receive the tokens in a more timely manner particularly those who are you know you know users of the platform who have we have good user experience with and so as we go kind of go forward it's not always going to be that way you know eventually we'll have a situation where an individual will be able to instant mint usdm with a fiat transaction with the understanding that's not going to be clawed back uh, on the fiat side so that that that's sort of another matter that we're working I, through. That's the first time that I've heard something like that. And I think that yeah, could actually be a big reason why people come to Mahen. I hope so. And I hope that, it, that it's a useful tool for everybody. But I think that we need to make sure that we have a good uh, track record of you know interaction with individuals. And so I think Farid, I would not be worried about you coming in and saying, oh, you know, thanks for the USDM. I'm going to claw back my, uh, my fiat. But at the same time, um, you know, I think we would be not being good stewards of the reserve if we would just allow that from the start. So we'll be good stewards of the reserve and we'll make sure that we take the right operational tasks and make sure we have you know, good risk parameters around who we allow would do that and who we would not. Thank you, Matt. Um, again, I'm looking forward to, to seeing how that plays out and how that affects people's adoption of men. I think that'll be a, a really big bonus. Um, yeah, that's like a big... late 23 or late 24, right? It's like a, yeah. something we'll work on later. No, completely understood. I, I appreciate that. The very last thing for today's interview is going to be chain race. So we had to bump this back, right? This was supposed to be one of the earlier things that we're going to talk about. But yeah, you know, do you mind talking about chain race, what it is and what it gives people access to do and what will they actually be a owner of by participating in chain race? So uh, a lot of companies, a lot of crypto companies that have launched tokens have sort of the um, the token issuing entity, and then they have a second entity that's kind of like the labs, that is the business entity that runs the, you know, pays the payroll and, and keeps the profits from the token and that kind of thing. So it, with Mihan, there are there are two entities. One of them is called uh, Mihan Finance LLC. That's the token issuer. That's the one that holds the licenses. That's the one that's regulated. And there's a second company that uh, has a licensing agreement, makes a software, licenses with Mihan Finance LLC to get all of the revenue from the stablecoin reserve and from the operations of 
the company and they make the software. So there, there's sort of a parent company and then a subsidiary kind of relationship here. And the parent company used to be called Meehan Innovations. And it got confusing for a lot of our regulated partners when we just said Meehan, they weren't sure with would we say Meehan Finance or Meehan Innovations. So we renamed it to W3C, right? So W3I Software. So it's a software company. Um, so W3I Software is Meehan's kind of parent company that we're doing a, a Reg CF crowdfunding raise. We started on WeFunder last year and we got commitments of around $275,000 within a few weeks uh, to raise you know, kind of capital for the company and have investors who actually owned shares of the stablecoin issuer um, or the, the company that sort of the parent company. And to that end, we went with WeFunder we got to a point with WeFunder that they would not be able to, we realized they would not be able to tokenize the offering. We've always committed to our investors that we would like to find a way to legally tokenize the equity offering on chain uh, at Cardano. And so we worked through a couple of different partners to do this Reg CF offering. And we ended up in a company called Chainraise. And Chainraise is, um, their process is a little different. The WeFunder process allowed us to advertise the, the offering and um, try to get commitments before we actually submitted the paperwork to the SEC for the for the raise. And so now what we're doing is we're going through a process where we're completing the paperwork for the SEC, we're submitting it. We think we have one last draft before we can submit it to, um, to FINRA and to the SEC for review for this offering. But it's a, you know, it's a legal um, offering to get private securities um, it for me, and so you use like private investors, typically outside of a reg CF, which is called a crowdfunding, is you know like accredited investors only, and it's um, very limiting for how much you can raise. But the the reg CF is a little better uh, for individuals who want to invest. Um, this is sort of a kind of a, an opportunity for individuals who are not accredited investors to invest in. Startups, uh, I think WeFunder is a is a popular startup platform, but but Chainraise will allow us to tokenize the equity, and so that's what we're doing is we're going with Chainraise. We'll make some announcements once that's available, but I think that given the delay in the in the token launch, we wanted to make sure that we focused on that before we got distracted by the fundraiser or by a, by an equity round. So we're trying to focus on building the token, getting the chief smart contract changes done testing the integration from front to back and making sure that everything works. And then we'll go through their chain raise and we'll have investors come in and, and try to try to get you know investor interest in the company. But I think that a big a big part of this is, you know, we're a bunch of Cardano community members that are not venture backed. We got, you know, we got a little bit of money from a couple of different people in the community, but it's not like it's been uh, you know, we're going we're here, we're coming here with tons of money to try to build something and then launch it on Cardano and then make a big splash. We're we're really the community trying to build this um, with a few few people who have narrow expertise in the in the uh, in the area, so you know this is this is our ability to raise capital to get the company involved, um, or get the community involved in ownership of the company, and then tokenize equity as a demonstration project for our next thing, which will be to do tokenized equity on Cardano. That's a whole other matter, like further on. So we'll be back to talk with you about that later um, when that becomes a little more clear. Ladies and gentlemen. Matt Plowman, president and founder of Mahen, bringing one of the first ever fiat-backed stablecoins to Cardano, hopefully later this March. Um, you ended it off there with a nice little tease. Um, I'm more than happy to have you back here um, any day, uh, Matt. Again, I think this has been by far the best interview that you and I have had, um, one of the most in-depth and one of the most that I've actually learned you know, about Mahen about. So I hope that the viewers today find this particular interview to be helpful. If you guys watching at home would like to find out more about Mahen and everything that their fiat back stable coin is going to be offering to Cardano, make sure to go ahead and check out the links down below as a part of today's video description. As always, if you guys did enjoy today's video, um, again, huge thank you to Matt. Make sure to go ahead and smash that thumbs up. If it's your first time stopping by Dapsen, Central, and you want more content like this covering all the builders here on Cardano, consider subscribing. And last but not least, if you have any questions for Matt, you know, surrounding Mahen or myself, make sure to go ahead and leave those down below. That said, and as always, we'll see you guys in the next video.